Hello, everyone. This is John Shaw, the director of the Paul Simon Public Policy Institute at Southern Illinois University. Thank you for joining another edition of our series, Understanding Our New World. And today we're very fortunate to be joined by Mary Robinson, one of the most uh, respected and admired leaders in the world. Uh, Mrs. Robinson was the president of Ireland. She's been the former UN High Commissioner for Human Rights. Uh, she's been a U UN envoy on climate change. Um, has won pretty much every award you would want to win, uh, including the U.S. Presidential Medal of Freedom that was conferred upon her by Barack Obama in 2009. And she's currently the chair of a group called the Elders that is doing a lot of really important work, which we will uh, discuss. So, Mrs. Robinson, thank you so much for joining us. We really feel fortunate to have you. It's a pleasure. Great. And I should also add that Mrs. Robinson is the author of two terrific books, which I've had the opportunity to read. The first is called Climate Justice, came out just uh, two years ago, talking about the connection between climate change and human rights. So we're going to talk about that. And also a, a wonderful memoir called Everybody Matters. And I, I have someone who's a connoisseur of memoirs, this is one of the very best I've ever read. Uh, it's funny, it's interesting, it's informative, it's modest, it's self-deprecating, it's self-critical. And at the end of it, as you're closing down the book, you say, I would really love to meet this person. So I feel that uh, this is a great opportunity. And let me ask you just the first question about writing the memoir, because I've talked to people who've done memoirs and they tend to cluster in two extremes. Some have found the experience exhilarating, interesting, you know, pulling their life together. And others have found it, you know, excruciating, tedious, exhausting. In that continuum, how, how, what was your experience like in writing this memoir? I was clear that I wanted to write it, but I wasn't going to find it too easy. And actually, it was lovely to do it with my daughter because uh, she's our eldest. So she had the memory pretty far back. And um, we worked very well on it. And uh, I think, she kept me honest. Uh, for example, after I became High Commissioner for Human Rights, I had moved from a very well-organized, very supported, very popular presidency, if I could say that, um, where everything worked very smoothly, to a small UN office, newly formed, uh, underfunded, full of difficulties. And I wanted to do the best I could because I was a human rights person. And I found I was responsible for so many different issues and problems. And I kept taking sleeping pills and not sleeping. And I ground myself into a really bad position by Christmas of 1997. I had started in September. By Christmas, I went back to Ireland for a two week break. And a brother of mine came, who was a doctor, came back from New Zealand and took a look at me and said, Mary, you're on the verge of a mental breakdown. And I was so furious hearing my brother saying that, that I decided to throw away the pills and took another fortnight and worked my way out of it. But I didn't want to write about that. And my daughter said, mom, I remember, you wouldn't talk to any of us. You went into your room in, on your own. You, 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 you were out of it. And I did write about it. And when the book came out in Ireland, that was probably the most significant chapter. Because if Mary Robinson can be on the verge of a mental breakdown, you know, there's hope for all of us, if I can put it that way. It, it, it was important to me, and it was a lesson that I learned to be open about your vulnerabilities, you know, to not to be afraid to talk about the weak moments. Yeah, and that, I mean, that came through very st starkly. One of the things that I, uh, you know, it was interesting to kind of look at the turning points in your life. And, and one of them you comes quite early. You're 17 years old. You're from a devoutly Catholic family. You uh, approach the Reverend Mother, uh, the provincial from, I think it was the Sacred Heart Order, and talk about joining the convent. And she, you have an interesting conversation, which led to a very kind of consequential year in Paris. Tell us about that. Yeah, I mean... In Ireland at that time, there were not many options for a young 17-year-old. I tried very hard to become a poet. I went to the eighth summer school twice um, at the age of 15 and 16 and tried very hard to be a writer. And it didn't work out well. And I had nuns in my background, one particular nun who had done incredible things in India, teaching very rich girls, first of all, and then very poor girls. And she was in correspondence with my father and... I, I found, you know, what she was doing was really worthwhile. So I'll become a nun and do something worthwhile in the world. And, then, and the Reverend Mother had the sense to think that maybe if I went away for a year, 
And my parents, you know, Catholic doctors, were so proud of their only daughter, I was the only one among four brothers, um, that they sent me to Paris for a year, which was not easy. You know, they had to save up to do it. And of course, that changed everything. Yeah, and you, you describe it as one of the most eye-opening years of your life in terms of even study, questioning your faith, opening your, yourself to just uh, kind Very of horizon. Much so, yes, because we were taught by superb teachers and I was opened to French culture, uh, French art, the Jeux de Paume, um, museums. Um, the fact that throughout France, the culture was so strong and so different and so vibrant and this to me was an eye-opener itself. I remember so many uh, different uh, you know, opportunities to savor uh, the best of French culture. And then I had the philosophers and I, I kind of realized that bottled up inside me was this sense of a patriarchal church, which you know, favored boys as altar boys, uh, priests were only men. I had to wear scarves in church. Uh, somehow I was less important because I was female, a woman, a young woman. And uh, I didn't really lose and have not lost the sense that the gospel of Jesus Christ is the highest moral code that anyone could ever hope to live towards. And I still try and fail. And as Beckett said, fail better, but, <laughs> but fail. And um, so it was more a reaction against uh, the, uh, that, that patriarchy of the church, which also was abuse by the church, as I learned later, and many other problems. Um, but uh, I, I'm not completely outside the fold. I'm on the outer critical edges, um, but still believe in the depths of the message. Right. And then, uh, you know, another, I guess it was a few years later, you had another kind of eye-opening experience when you, uh, you, you had an opportunity to go to Harvard Law School for a year. You went to Boston, I think it was 67, 68. So, you know, obviously an eye-opening experience for you in terms of a new culture, but one of the most consequential years in American history in terms of, of that. So talk about both kind of the personal development in terms of legal training and also this occurring against the backdrop of civil rights and uh, assassinations and other things. Yeah, it was an incredible year. I've always acknowledged that it was a year that changed me in a way that I'm grateful for. Uh, when I arrived, um, I found most of my American peers were questioning the morality of the Vietnam War, trying to avoid the draft, and also critical of uh, the fact that this was happening. And it led to much more interesting discussions about the role of law and law and morality, you know, everything that I really cared about. We actually sat on the floor at times, sometimes with some good professors, just questioning everything. And then in April, Martin Luther King was assassinated. And I remember the grief on black and white television, that's all we had. Um, uh, you know, we were all crying because it was so traumatic. The funerals the, and, the, and the, uh, the riots in part of Boston uh, where taxis wouldn't take you anymore and you know, where there was quite a security issue. Um, and then just after I graduated, my father was in, um, uh, in Boston for my graduation in Harvard and we went to New York and I woke up one morning and heard this radio and I thought it was talking about the Kennedy, John F. Kennedy assassination, but it was the assassination of Robert Kennedy. Now, somehow it's hard to convey how dramatic that was in 1968 because the world has become more violent. It wouldn't have the same impact now, but it had a huge impact on me and on my father at the time. And we actually went out on a boat um, out around um, uh, the Statue of Liberty, almost to get away somehow from this violence, which was really hard to understand. But on reflection, what I brought back to Ireland with me was a sense that was very different from the mood in Ireland at the time. And that was that young people could actually make a difference. I remember it very well, that sense of what, what Nick called my Harvard humility, <laughs> that young people could actually make a difference, as so many of my contemporaries were trying to do in the civil rights movement in the South, tackling poverty in the southern part of the country as well. And that was what caused me to say, to question in the parliamentary elections in Ireland the following year in 1969, why it was always elderly male professors who stood in the two university streams for the six seats in the Irish Senate, a Senate of 60 people, but there were six seats for 
graduates of the university to vote for by postal ballot. And uh, historically always men and elderly and professors. And I questioned this and was elected at the age of 25. I would never have done that without Harvard. I would never have thought of putting myself forward. And uh, just the, the sheer unexpectedness of a Catholic standing for Trinity, because it was still perceived, it was changing, but perceived as a majority Protestant university, being a woman and being so young, that combination became a winning combination as it happened. And you, you assembled this remarkably interesting career in which you were a law professor and you said how much you love teaching. You were a constitutional lawyer, particularly interested in human rights issues in Ireland, and then also at the age of 25 as a senator. I mean, how did you stitch together these three strands or did they all kind of come together in a, in a relatively easy way? I think they complemented each other. I mean, I was, you know, aware I, I had a very rich life. And of course, I married in December 1970, and we began to have our three children, um, two of them quite rapidly, and then a third um, a little bit later. And so it, it, was a, uh, it was a busy but very fulfilled time. I loved the teaching. I was very interested in the practice of law, and I was very proactive as a senator. And all of it kind of fed one into the other. I, um, if you're teaching, you learn. And um, if you're uh, preparing legislation or um, being involved in legislation, you learn. And so I was learning and learning. <laughs> you, you tell one story, you said one aspect of teaching is when you get a question that you don't quite know the answer to, you, you develop a technique for sort of setting a context and just uh, kind of buying some time to assemble your thoughts. Exactly. It's called bluffing. <laughs> <laughs> Well, then in, in 1990, you, know, you ran for the presidency. And I guess, you know, I was back in the U.S. and reading about it. And I guess I had not, I sort of thought, oh, my gosh, this is really interesting. But I had not realized until I read your book what a long shot candidate you were. I mean, some bookmaker said it was 100 to 1, um, you know, kind of a liberal intellectual from Dublin challenging the presidency. There was, I think it was a three-person race, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Tell us about that race. And, and your theme was a president with purpose. What did you mean by that? Well, I hadn't ever thought about um, an idea of becoming president. It was, wasn't on my horizon. I actually retired from the Irish Senate after being re-elected enough to, be, uh, to, to cover 20 years of you know, being re-elected. I had tried twice for the lower house, for the Dáil, and failed. So I had my failures. But I retired in August uh, 1969 because I felt I'd made my contribution. I was also very engaged as a lawyer on not only constitutional issues, but also human rights issues in the courts in both Luxembourg for the European Union and Strasbourg, the, the Council of Europe on human rights. I loved those cases. And they were for small people against the, the government of Ireland. And I was winning most of them. And life was good. And we had our three children and we had a center for European law in Trinity. So I was very surprised when the Labour Party asked me to become a candidate. They wanted to contest the election and they wanted a good candidate. And when I was asked, I initially was disposed to say no. And it was on Valentine's Day, I remember, in 1990. And my husband said, um, when, I, when I rang him and said, you know, you won't believe this, but the Labour Party want me to run for president. I was scathing, you know, I was thinking, come on. And he said, you know, let's have lunch together. It's, it's Valentine's Day. <laughs> and he asked me to read the provisions of the Constitution. And as soon as I read the particular part of the Constitution, which I hadn't actually read, although I was you know, a constitutional lawyer. I just skipped over it. It was the oath of office of the president if you're directly elected by the people. And it, it, it's very simple and straightforward to do my very best on behalf of the people of Ireland. Malon Yihil Ayenov in Irish. And I remember that, you know, my goodness, to have somebody who could actually, outside politics, represent Ireland nationally, locally, and internationally. And my, my mind was on fire with the possibilities. So when I started at 100 to 1 outsider, I was an advocate for whoever became president doing a much better job. And that's how I proceeded for several months. And I was interviewed then um, on local radio, on local newspapers. And because I was the only candidate initially, they gave me yards of time. And I was learning, again, learning what was happening in Ireland in 1990. And it was fascinating. Uh, what was happening was uh, the European Union had meant that there was money coming into rural Ireland through the common agricultural policy. And people were beginning to get excited 
about the facilities for young people or the facilities for the elderly, but they, the government wasn't providing them except in Dublin and the major cities. But in towns and villages around the country, people volunteered. It was called, you know, self-development. And there was an Irish word for it, the spirit of mehel. There's no English translation for mehel, but it means something like Ubuntu. You know, I am because you are. Um, a kind of neighborly help that my father had told me about, you know, as a medical doctor going around the country with very poor patients in County Mayo. And he would say, look at those farmers in the field. And they would be clustered together with maybe one tractor. And he'd say, next week they'll be in the next field and then beyond that. And if, the, if a farmer is sick, his field will be done because that's the spirit of Mehel. And I found there was this spirit of self-development for the young people in the parish, the elderly, sports, culture, and it was changing the face of rural Ireland. And I talked this up because I was so excited about it. And it somehow gave me um, a, an entry point as an intellectual from Dublin, who was rather left-wing and liberal for some of the audience, into mainstream, mainstream, uh, what country people in particular wanted. I went to the islands and was photographed you know, on, on the island, Aran Islands. I went to Inishmore. I went to Cork to a, um, a convention of coastal communities from throughout Ireland. But of course, everybody's related to everybody in Ireland. So people understood the coastal communities and the islands. And they, you know, so in many ways, uh, I, I, I look back on that campaign as being an extraordinary opportunity to know and love my country, you know, in a way that equipped me, I think, to represent that country then, because I had got to know um, the heart of the country and the generosity and the compassion and the neighborliness and the get up and go spirit of the country. Well, once you came to office, uh, you are sort of forging a new role for the presidency and you had a prime minister who, you know, had his prerogatives as head of government, your head of state. And you tell a wonderful story about the Dalai Lama coming to Dublin. I think there was a Tibetan exhibit of some sort at a library. And the government, you know, under pressure from China was saying, you know, stay away, don't go. And you thought, you know, this was something that was important for you. And so you, you met the Dalai Lama and were, the, I think, the only European head of state to do that. Tell us about that, that moment. Yeah, it's very hard to explain how tense it was as a moment, because I wasn't even inviting the Dalai Lama to come to my official residence. I was accepting an invitation to join him to open a Tibetan exhibition in a wonderful collection in Dublin. And uh, I you know, felt as a human rights person, I really want to do this. Um, and I got three letters from the um, uh, Prime Minister, Charles Hawhey. He didn't want me to go. And he was kind of not saying you can't go, but kind of uh, sort of sinister warnings that were hard to figure. And I thought, you know, my, my uh, secretary was advising me, my secretary general of the office was advising me, uh, maybe Ireland has some economic um, negotiation with China that you don't know about, and you will have undermined that. And this was the pressure, you know, that I was doing a human rights thing. I wanted to meet the Dalai Lama, but would I somehow cut across? And I thought, no, I really, I really feel I have to meet the Dalai Lama. It's important. And then on the... Uh, afternoon of the last day, because this was going on for several days, I got a, um, a, my secretary general ran, ran into my office, which he never does, and said, it's over. The prime minister has gone to his island. He'd gone for the weekend <laughs> down to his island off Cork, off Kerry. And um, so all was well. I could go ahead. And as I went, uh, my car drove. There were two ministers. One of them would become Taoiseach, Bertie O'Hearn, waiting in a car to see if I went to meet the Dalai Lama, and then they followed me. <laughs> so, you know, uh, but these are, these are hard to explain. Um, it, it's about, in the end, having the courage to do something, to take the risk, but it was not easy. And when I met the Dalai Lama, I was mentally and physically exhausted. And I remember him putting his arm on mine, and he had, his arm was bare, the sleeves were bare, and he put his hand on my arm, and he said, I know, I know, and you know, it, it, it was, it, was, it was interesting. And then he did use the photograph of the two of us um, to promote you know, his own uh, very strong moral message, which I very strongly support. 
Right. Well, one of the things you did as president, you uh, understanding the importance of symbol, you had you you put a, a lantern or a light in the presidential um, residence as a symbol both to the 70 million or so people around the world who are have Irish ancestry, but also a symbol to other people in Ireland who feel, felt excluded. Tell us about that, the, the power of that symbol. Yes, yeah, so it, it actually taught me the importance of symbols and their power. Uh, I underestimate it because I said on the night, on the excitement of the night of the election result before the inauguration, the actual result when I was president elect. And I said, I would put a light in the window of, of the official residence for all of those who had had to leave Ireland over the years. That was the main focus. And uh, I had envisaged a candle and then we were told, no, no, a candle might burn the place down. So we actually got a lamp made with no off switch. And we put it in the kitchen of our residence, um, which was on the second floor where we lived above the main formal rooms. And you could see it from the road through the Phoenix Park. So for me, the symbol was perfect. The light was in the kitchen and you could see it from the road. And it reminded me of my mother every Christmas, putting a big light in our windows because our home was opposite the cathedral in the small town of Ballina. And the light was at Christmas to say nobody should be homeless at Christmas and anybody could come in. And I remember as a small child being quite frightened that somebody might come in, you know, but nobody ever did, but the symbol was there. And when I traveled, and I traveled a lot as president of Ireland um, to meet the Irish community in different places and to make state visits. And I never mentioned the light myself because I was always greeted by, we know you have a light in the window and it matters so much to us. And I, I'll never forget you know, just how much it mattered to people and still does. And you point out too, that you also meant it as a symbol for people who, are, who are mar felt marginalized in Ireland and told a really powerful story about a, some reception where you met a gentleman who didn't have a job. And he said something like, you know, the unemployed don't get invited to a lot of things. That's right, day. yes. That, that was, was a actually, powerful That was actually moment. a reception for the unemployed. And he said to me, he was speaking on behalf, and he said, you know, President, I have to tell you, the, the unemployed don't get many invitations. <laughs> yeah, but I, right. I wanted to, I, I had, um, you know, one of the early visits, which was very moving, was um, the uh, gay and lesbian community in the whole island of Ireland, because they were, you know, linked north and south. And that was very early days. And I remember it vividly, because it was quite customary when somebody came on a visit to my official residence, a group like that, that we would go outside to the steps to look at the light in the window and take a group photograph. So after we'd had our discussion, I said, would you like to come outside and we'll have a photograph taken? And I noticed that several wouldn't be photographed. They hid behind the pillars because they were not out to their whole community, maybe not to an aunt, maybe not to, even though they were the official um, you know, group for gay and lesbian rights in Ireland. And that struck me very much, you know, their vulnerability, but at least they'd had their day. And it was the same with the unemployed. And I always tried when I went around the country and I went around a lot to find that person, it might be a 13 year old shy girl or a nun at the very back of a room, Sister Anne, who had organized the whole thing, but she was quietly behind. And I would learn and then find her. And, you know, uh, just the things you have to learn, uh, who, who matters even though they don't want to push themselves or don't think they matter. Um, and I remember uh, feeling very much as a woman president that I needed to reach out not to, just to successful women, but to the women who were so active in their communities, but felt they were only housewives. Um, we, we described them, and I mentioned them in my, inaugural, in my acceptance speech um, as president-elect. I thanked the women of Ireland and I used the term Manon na Heron, which was a pejorative term. It was a bit like yeah, the word Sheila in, in Australia, you know, um, a, 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 a derogative word for women. But Manon na Heron was ach Manon na Heron, you know, um, wasn't, wasn't respectful. And I deliberately used that term because they were the ones who came out and voted for me. And I can tell you a little anecdote which stays with me much later that I heard that proved the point I was making. Um, it was a young, uh, I was speaking uh, about human rights in Boise, Idaho, during my time for realizing rights when I was based in New York. I was mainly working for Africa on economic and social rights, but because I was based in New York, I would also give some lectures 
in universities usually around the states. And this was Boise, Idaho, quite a big Irish population. And as I finished the lecture to about 400 people, to my surprise, it was quite a sizable audience, uh, this youngish woman strode up to the podium and I came down actually to greet her because she obviously wanted, she was smiling. She obviously wanted to, to meet me. And she said, I want to shake your hand, she said. You were my first boat. I was 19 at the time. And when I told my father, he nearly killed me. And I'll never forget that. You know, the, uh, she, she spoke in staccato. It meant so much to her you know, to convey, uh, you were my first boat. And I went against my father, you know, and there was a lot of that. <laughs> Well, you also tell a remarkable story about a trip to the, I think it was in 1997, traveling to the U.S. to uh, meet with a, a, a tribal group in Oklahoma who had conferred remarkable generosity on the Irish. Tell us about that. Well, that's a story that's alive today um, in its impact. So I'm delighted to tell it. Um, a lot of people in Ireland knew of this story, and I knew it, of the Choctaw people who had met in 1847 to mourn the 10 years since they were driven from their tribal lands through what they call the Vale of Tears, uh, the Valley of Tears. And uh, we don't know how, we think it was a passing priest must have told them that there was an island far away where people were starving because the crop, the potato crop had failed for the third year, 1845, 1846, 1847. And it was disastrous. And the Choctaw people raised $173 and sent it for the relief of Irish famine victims. Mm -hmm. So in 1997, as president of Ireland, I went on the 150th anniversary of this to thank the Choctaw people for their act of pure humanity, pure, pure humanitarian consideration, no link that we knew of. But the Victorians had recorded the money that had come in and had been dispensed for Irish famine victims. And I spoke about this when I was High Commissioner for Human Rights because I was, I was um, uh, part of the uh, decade, I was coordinator of the decade for Indigenous Peoples. But now Irish people are supporting Indigenous tribes in the United States because we have learned they are suffering disproportionately from COVID. And they are amazed at the flow of money that's going from Ireland to the um, Idaho, I think, I, I, um, the, the um, uh, two different tribes in the United States that are suffering very badly. Wow, that's an amazing so it's, story. You know, it's a, it's a wonderful story because it has life still. Right. Well, you, you in your book, you say uh, the decision to leave, to not run for re-election was hard. I mean, it's a seven-year term. You are certain that you could give it your all for three or four years. You weren't sure that seven was, was, was right. You, you, you know, hard decision, you decided not to run for re-election. This position at the UN opens up, it seems perfect, but as you described earlier, um, once you walked in, it was uh, kind of a bureaucratic, uh, there were many, many bureaucratic complexities sur surrounding a, a laudable mission of supporting human rights. Yeah, it was uh, a very st steep learning curve of how difficult it is to work within a multilateral system when you're in an underfunded office, when there are so many human rights problems all over the world and somehow you've got to give leadership on them. And I learned that the only way to give this leadership was simply to go to where the worst problems were. So I went to uh, you know, parts of Africa. Um, I went to um, the uh, really terrible problems in the Democratic Republic of Congo, to Goma, saw the terrible sexual violence there. I went to Colombia where there were terrible problems. One of the most striking visits was to Chechnya in Russia when the Russians were bombing it and seeing people come out from under obliterated buildings, um, you know, an old man and then a woman with a pram to the stalls at the uh, crossroads where people were selling uh, whatever food was available um, or even giving it away in some cases. And, um, and then I would report back to the Human Rights Commission or report and, and somehow... I learned the power of listening, of being in places, of being in Sierra Leone with a family who told me, a mother and father who told me how their five children had been assassinated during the civil war in Sierra Leone. Um, and, and they're crying and showing me photographs and sharing their tears as the only human rights thing I could do. I didn't have any big stick. 
I didn't have any. And it was a big lesson that uh, somehow a moral voice and a willingness to listen can be powerful in conveying that human rights do matter, that you are a person that requires full respect for who you are. And, you know, um, I, I learned a lot in those five years. I did an extra year, which began on 9-11, ironically. So I became a critical voice then of the Bush administration. And, uh, you know, that was hard as well. That was very tough. But I was very proud at the end of the five years at how the office had developed into a genuine office uh, with the right priorities about human rights. And I'm still very proud and still very close to each high commissioner, including the current high commissioner, Michel Bachelet. Well, in your, your, your writings, you refer to a document that is, you know, probably not even that well known in the United States. And yet you describe it, I think, uh, persuasively as one of the foundational documents, certainly of, the, of, of recent history, which is the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, human rights. largely written in the U.S. Eleanor Roosevelt played a major role. Tell us about the importance of this document and maybe why more Americans should take a look at it and understand it. I would really recommend, uh, you know, it, it's an extraordinarily interesting read because Eleanor Roosevelt wasn't a lawyer. She was a teacher in her background and she knew how to communicate. And she was the chair of the commission that drew up this Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948. And she said, um, you know, make it readable to ordinary people because if human rights don't matter in small places close to home, they won't matter at all. So they've got to matter to people. And uh, I was lucky enough as High Commissioner that I began in September 1997. So I began in 1998 with the 50th anniversary of the Universal Declaration. I actually proudly got a copy of the Guinness Book of Records, a plaque about Guinness Book of Records, because the Universal Declaration of Human Rights became the most translated document in the world. I traveled to China that year in 1998, and I went to Tibet with a Tibetan copy. And my human rights officers were a little worried. And they said, you know, High Commissioner, we're not sure if this is legal. And I said, I don't care. I'm the High Commissioner and I'm bringing this. Um, I mean, let me just, because I know it so well, it's engraved on my heart, give you the first sentence of Article 1. All human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. And I have often taught law students about what does it mean to put dignity before rights? What, what is that dignity? And it is that sense of self. It is, and it's all about Black Lives Matter. It's all about, you know, colonialism. It's all about all of the things that are the inequalities in our world that have subjected people because of caste, because of class, because of race, because of subjugation of whatever sort. And uh, it, it, it's a wonderful document. Well, you, um, you make a really strong and powerful connection between human rights and climate. And that's a, a connection maybe is not immediately obvious to a lot of people, but uh, you, you describe that, that the people most affected by climate change now are the ones in many ways who are the least culpable for it. Describe this connection between climate change, the challenge we face and human rights. Well, I was very slow to make that connection. Um, and I'm always very humble about that because I served for seven years as president of Ireland in, and didn't speak about climate. I think I might've spoken about the environment without linking it to climate change. I wasn't aware. When I became high commissioner, I was more aware, but there was another part of the UN dealing with it. I didn't make the connection with my world of human rights. It was afterwards when I started working in African countries on the rights that matter if you don't have them, the rights to food, water, health, education, um, safety, security, women, peace and security issues. And I now actually, uh, because I've been working on climate justice for 20 years, I now would see five layers, which I can explain very briefly, of injustice that mean that we have to have a climate justice approach, if I could put it that way, to the climate crisis. The first layer is that it disproportionately affects the poorest countries and the poorest communities and the small island states who are not responsible because they don't drive cars, they don't have major manufacturing or central heating, et cetera. And yet they're disproportionately affected because of where they live in vulnerable parts of the world or in vulnerable parts of rich countries because hotel, um, uh, Hurricane Katrina is a good example of um, the impact it had on people of color who still are not fully recovered. And now Louisiana is gonna be hit by another 
hurricane. So, you know, it's tough. Um, that's the first layer of injustice. The second layer is within that, the impact on women. Uh, they have to put food on the table. They have to go further in drought for the water or for the firewood. Um, they don't have land rights. They don't have access to capital. They don't have the training to make themselves resilient, but they have to you know, form groups in their community to desperately you know, fight back. And that was what my book in Climate Justice is about. Um, uh, there are 11 stories and nine of them are about women fighting back and making their communities resilient. Um, the third layer is the one the children have reminded us of, the intergenerational injustice, really important because we're not providing a safe world for future generations. And they are still implacably angry with us. And understandably, I'm a grandmother, I have seven grandchildren now, and I understand that anger. And I'm very supportive of Greta Thunberg and everything she's trying to do and all the millions of children who come out on Fridays for Future. The fourth injustice is subtle, but very, very important. Um, it's the injustice of the pathways to development. The industrialized countries, the United States, Europe, Ireland, uh, Korea, Japan, we built our economies on fossil fuel. That's fine. I respect the workers in fossil fuel and coal and oil and gas. They help to build our economies. They need the respect of that. But now we have to wean ourselves off fossil fuel with just transition. And that's our problem. But think of developing countries. Um, before Paris, and I was special envoy on climate, as you mentioned at that time, uh, there were commitments made by all countries as to how they would deal with the Paris Agreement. And they agreed, and the poorest countries, the small island states, and even the larger poor developing countries committed to going as green as possible, clean energy. But they said, we will need the investment, we will need the training, we will need the, um, the know-how, etc. And they haven't actually got that kind of support. But what they have found is coal and oil and gas in their country, and especially in countries in Africa. So what do they do? They've got to take their people out of poverty. Do they go the dirty energy route? And then we have less chance of a future for our children and grandchildren. Or do we show the solidarity? So that's um, a real dilemma. And it's a very active dilemma at the moment um, because countries want to take their people out of poverty. And if they have the means to do it, um, then unless they have support to go the clean energy way, which is the only way to have a safe future. And the fifth layer of injustice is the one I came to last, but now prioritize most. And that's the injustice against nature herself. Uh, the loss, loss of biodiversity, the extinction of species, the way in which we've created a world where we're subject to pandemics, to COVID-19 to SARS, MERS, Ebola, and now COVID-19. And we will have other pandemics if we don't learn to regenerate, reforest, respect wildlife, not have wet markets with wild, uh, not have that ca capacity for the virus to jump from the animal to human, from bats probably in this case, um, uh, possibly indirectly, but to hum that's how COVID started. We will have more pandemics. Um, Bill Gates has warned us over and over again, this was predictable. He's an expert. He predicted and predicted. Drew Brundt, my fellow elder, uh, predicted that we would have a pandemic like this unless we respected nature far more. And it's all kind of connected in my mind in this concept of climate justice that is talking about um, not just um, the gender and human rights and um, need to address racial issues of people, but also um, the biodiversity and the link with nature. It's all a holistic link now. And if we'd only listened more to indigenous peoples, we would have understood this from an earlier stage. Well, in your book, which I think you wrote in 2018, you, you describe 2020 as, as, as a pivot moment. And I guess yeah. you know, scientists have said that unless you know, the, the curve turns yeah. decisively and clearly this year, we're, it's going to be hard to, to salvage uh, yeah. as good a future. Uh, you know, we're only in September, almost September. Do you have a sense of whether... 2020 is going to have been a, a positive year? I had an extraordinary uh, evolution during this year for the very reason that you said. I began by being very worried. Uh, as chair of the elders that Nelson Mandela brought together, we're supposed to bring hope and work for peace and human rights. But I wasn't feeling very hopeful in January because we needed huge ambition, a concerted effort by the world to get on top of the climate crisis. 
and prepare for a conference in Glasgow in November, which was going to be absolutely key. And I didn't see this happening. And then COVID-19 hit initially in China, but then all over the world. And it has been devastating, but it also has been a wake up call of a useful nature in many ways. I'll tell you just about four lessons that I think we can learn from COVID. The first lesson is an interesting one. It is that collective human behavior matters. That's the only thing at the moment that is protecting us from the virus because we don't have a vaccine yet. So it's our willingness to obey lockdown, social distancing, washing our hands and other protocols. That's helping to combat this virus. When we come out as we will, we must remember this in the context of what to do about consumption. We're over consuming, over producing for our world. So you know, that's a lesson to hold and think about. The second one is government matters. It's been so clear that government um, makes a difference. And I'm glad to say, and I, I say it quite often, women-led governments have been doing exceptionally well, whether it's Angela Merkel in Germany or the prime ministers of Norway, Denmark, Finland, Iceland in Europe, um, the president of Barbados or the uh, Ursa, um, uh, um, uh, New Zealand, um, uh, Jacinta Ardern, whom I know as a friend, or the uh, president of, Thail uh, of Taiwan, close to China, and, and others. Um, you know, taking decisions based on science, taking tough decisions early, and bringing your people with you, with building trust um, in clear messaging. I think that's been, uh, you know, uh, clearly re recognized um, phenomenon of women's leadership in, in this crisis, which I'm glad to see. And the third issue is related to that, I've mentioned it, that science matters. I mean, we're seeing every government side by side with the health experts and more or less trying to comply. And if they're not complying, then people are getting sicker or dying in greater numbers. Science matters. I think after this, climate science matters. We have to really pay attention um, to the science. And the last thing, and it's an interesting, more human dimension to it, actually compassion matters. We're seeing all over the world, and I've, I'm hearing about it all over the United States, the compassion of people for those who are suffering more, those who are the food parcels, the efforts to address where it's really hurting people. And I'm, I'm hearing more and more stories around the world and stories of trying to help other countries where um, they're suffering um, disproportionately from, from the um, virus. And I think it's because when you're suffering, you have more empathy for the suffering of others. And when I used to talk about climate justice and small island states and indigenous communities and poor countries, people would kind of look at me and sort of say, oh, but that's not me. And you know, there wasn't an empathy. Now I think there's more possibility for the empathy and solidarity we will need in order, as we come out of COVID, to remember we still have this climate crisis and we have to build back better with solidarity and an understanding of how the world can become a much better place, much healthier with clean energy and with um, biodiversity, regeneration, um, a farming that's close to the land, that's very good for farmers, good return for their thing, but also good for nature. Well, tell us about, you've made a couple of references to the elders, and this was a group created by, uh, in part by Nelson Mandela in 2007. I think you joined it in 2007, um, based on the concept of just the wisdom of village elders who've seen a bit of life and can put things into perspective. Tell us about how it works and what your, your central uh, program is. Yeah, I must say it was a really a great honor to be invited to join that group at the very beginning. I went to a planning meeting in May 2007, and we knew that Mandela had arrived um, because we heard the singing of all the staff in the place we were in, a wonderful African singing. And uh, Grasa Michelle was there, Archbishop Tutu, Jimmy Carter, Kofi Annan. Um, and um, when Mandela sat down in a very strong voice, he told us, um, you know, be humble, be independent, work for peace and human rights, but reach out to those who are marginalized, reach out to young people, reach out to women, reach out to those who are suffering. And um, when you go to a place, 
be humble and listen because the people there know far more about their place than you do. <laughs> Very good advice. And uh, then we had an inauguration on his 89th birthday in July 2007. And our first chair was Archbishop Desmond Tutu, whom I love. I saw him in South Africa in, in January of this year. And he's, um, he, he's weaker um, on, the, on, his set, on his pins, his, his legs, but he's in great form otherwise. And I love him dearly. We, we chatted. And the second chair was um, Kofi Annan. And I went with Kofi uh, to uh, South Africa for the 10th anniversary of the elders in, in July uh, 2018. And then I went with him on a working visit to Zimbabwe because Zimbabwe was to have elections at the end of July. And he was very concerned. He knew the place quite well as an African. Um, I went with himself and, and Lakhtar Brahimi, um, who was another very distinguished elder. And uh, we did our best, but Coffee wasn't feeling very well. And he became ill and died. Mm. And so now I fill big shoes as the third chair of the elders. And we work very hard and we're now working virtually as we have to mostly um, in, uh, but we have a very strong paper on multilateralism. We've been talking about COVID with Gru Brundtland, the former director general of the World Health Organization, um, giving leadership there. And we've been talking about peace with Juan Manuel Santos of Colombia, who made peace with the FARC and got the Nobel Prize. And um, uh, I, I feel, you know, humble among the company of my fellow elders because I used to be one of the younger elders so that's not true anymore I'm somewhere in the middle now <laughs> well let's uh, we have some questions from people who have emailed in and let me uh, begin with Mindy from Carbondale who asks um, of the American leaders you have met who has impressed you the most and also do you have any impressions of Kamala Harris um, I am very impressed with uh, two of the presidents that I've met in particular, Jimmy Carter, because of his total commitment to human rights, very, very unusual for uh, an American president during his time as president and as a, as a, a former president, the work he has done all around the world um, for health, for human rights, for African countries. When he passes, and I hope it won't be for some time, the world will stand still for Jimmy Carter. The whole world will stand still because he will have had such an impact, maybe far, far more than many Americans will realize. And then, of course, the second one, because he honored me with his Medal of Freedom, um, is President Obama, another uh, very uh, significant. I don't know Kamala Harris. I follow American politics, as most Irish people do, very closely. And I'm glad to see that she is uh, nominated with um, uh, Vice President Joe Biden. And um, I don't hide my desire for a change in the United States in November, because uh, we need that change very badly. Well, in fact, just as I was going to say, we, we tied, we, earlier we spoke with a, a Swedish diplomat who said he believes that for the world, this may be the most consequential American election, at least since 1932. Does that strike you as about right? I have no doubt. I have no doubt. Uh, another four years of President Trump would undermine so much for democracy, for multilateralism, um, would potentially... Uh, uh, license autocrats in a way, not just in the United States, where that would become more of a phenomenon, but also around the world in a way that would be really dangerous for uh, freedom and human rights. Okay. We have Amber from Chicago asks about the connection between um, uh, climate change and its challenges and those who have disabilities. That's a really good question because, of course, uh, that's part of the uh, way in which uh, the discriminations are compounded. I often mention, I didn't mention it earlier, and I, I almost regret that I didn't because I, I very often do, um, that you know, it dis climate change disproportionately affects people with disabilities because you know, if it's um, a hurricane, they can't move as quickly, um, whatever the issue, and they tend not to um, have the facilities that others have. Um, and in a way, COVID-19 has also been a mirror that has exacerbated all of the inequalities of this moment. Um, it's people of, who are brown and black in the United States and indigenous who are suffering most, and it's happening around the world. Um, it's people who are um, suffering from disabilities who are suffering the most. And it's, it's, it, it, it's made more clear through the, um, the, the, that mirror of heightening the inequalities that COVID provides. So I hope 
that we will you know, come back to that wonderful document, uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and actually refine the commitment to dignity and rights. And um, uh, as we build back better, as we must. And I, I, I do see uh, the European Union uh, with its Green New Deal, with its um, uh, farm to fork uh, policy on food, and with its biodiversity strategy, all those three really giving leadership. It's, it's still early, they, they haven't fully implemented, but all of the European countries will be implementing um, a, a way forward. Um, I'm impressed by the policies of the Biden, um, 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 you know, the Democratic Party um, on climate. Uh, I think that these are the best I've seen and they would be very good. This is the way we can uh, move forward and the elders would be 100% uh, working to, to support um, uh, you know, that approach as being vital for our world. Um, Leslie from Carbondale wonders, kind of playing off of that, if, if the Paris Agreement is a sufficient foundation for addressing this problem, does it need to be enhanced? And if the U.S. returned to it, would that make a, a, a fundamental difference? The Paris Agreement uh, has its weaknesses, I fully agree, but it is remarkable that 195 countries were able to agree it. And part of the key, and I remember this when I was a special envoy of the UN Secretary General before Paris, part of the key was the United States and China pushing each other. You know, the United States pushing China, China pushing the United States and agreeing. That was vital to getting the Paris Agreement. So it has been a, a, a big regret that President Trump is pulling the United States out. Technically, he can't do it until the 4th of November of this year. And, you know, there'll be an election. So um, we'll watch that space, let's put it that way. Um, but um, if um, the Biden administration comes in with its strong climate policies, that will make a huge difference. Um, it is completely doable to meet the goals of the climate agreement because the climate agreement goal was redefined by the scientists in October uh, 2018. The goal in the Paris Climate Agreement was to stay well below two degrees Celsius of warming and work for 1.5 degrees. The uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change um, uh, stated very clearly in October 2018 that um, there is a big difference between 1.5 degrees of warming and two degrees of warming. And in that period, bad things would happen the coral reefs would probably completely disappear, the Arctic ice would probably melt, and the permafrost, which has already begun to melt, would melt hugely and throw up not just carbon, but methane, which is much more dangerous in the short term. So uh, the scientists concluded clearly and adamantly that we, the whole world has to stay at 1.5 degrees, which is stricter than had been the political sense. The scientists said no, this is the sense we have to stay at 1.5. And that's why we actually need this year to move forward in 2020 to have the conference next year in 2021 that seals a way forward that every country, every city, every business, every community commits to be zero carbon by 2050 and work backwards. What does this mean in 2040, 2030, 2025? What does this mean? Um, and that's what countries are doing. That's what Ireland has signed up to. That's what many, many countries, that's what the European Union has signed up to. That's what many businesses have signed up to. And not enough, but, but quite a, you know, a significant number. And uh, that's, that's the way forward in a very practical science-led way. That's, that's the goal. We have a question from Bill from Chicago wondering if the US's image has been damaged permanently these last several years. I would say the U.S. image has been damaged, but not permanently. Uh, you know, undoubtedly, um, it has been set back. I mean, look at the Security Council. The United States is isolated, even on Iran, where, you know, in the past, this would never have happened uh, because it has not managed its world relations. It has fought with its friends and been far too nice to people who shouldn't be close friends of the United States. You know what I mean? So, but this is... This is um, perceived internationally as being a presidency which is different from any other presidency has been. If we go back to um, a more predictable presidency, I think um, a lot of that damage can be undone and quite rapidly.
What, what is your most hopeful um, scenario for the future? I mean, what, what, what is the best case over the next couple of years to just start turning some of these challenges around? In many ways, I take great hope from young people in our world today. Uh, I see young people as being very connected internationally. You know, they're not so rooted in the fact that they are from a territorial place. Yes, they love the United States or Ireland or um, uh, Japan or Korea or Africa, whatever, but they're also connected uh, in a different kind of way. And I, I think um, if we can link that connection with the kind of empathy that I spoke about, um, that sense, um, you know, what are we as human beings if we don't believe that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is something that we should all treasure as being a high achievement of the world and then um, you know, find ways to implement and then beyond the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the connection with the ecosystems that support us, with nature, with biodiversity, with regeneration, with reforestation. And I am very hopeful that these are the lessons that young people are talking about, that these are the lessons that uh, um, a, a world that has suffered a COVID, and COVID is, is extraordinary because it is actually global. It's everywhere. And it's not equal, it's very unequal, but it, somehow it has reminded us of the fragility of our humanity, of the connection with nature of our humanity. And I hope that young people will bring us forward with these lessons and remind us of the gains that we've had in the Universal Declaration, in the United Nations Charter itself, in the various agreements on human rights and on gender, on racial equality, et cetera, around the world, but that we start living this in a more dynamic way. Well, final question. You've been very generous with your time. I, you know, in your book, you talk about, obviously, you've traveled the world and you've been everywhere, but you also say that you have this deep, you know, deep connection to Ireland and particularly, you know, the, the place where you come from in the western part of Ireland. This is an unfair question, but if, if an American were visiting Ireland for the first time or someone from another country, and they were looking for three or four places that sort of conveyed the essence of Ireland, where would you suggest they visit? It is a tough question. I think I'd have to have my own bias um, to go west, uh, which means to go to the, uh, the Great Atlantic Way, it's called now. Um, and it's, uh, you know, it's that wonderful coastline along Galway, Mayo, um, and then down to Kerry, um, in, in, in the South um, and, and Cork. Uh, because our, our Ireland is an island, it's the coast around that is the fascinating place. And it's full of beaches and coves and you know, places. And, and um, you know, um, we are missing um, our American friends this year. And I think people are looking forward to, uh, hopefully, the time coming when uh, it will be possible uh, for people to come back and enjoy. And I think the enjoyment will be more thoughtful. I think we're all more conscious, um, not of um, easy mass tourism anymore, but actually uh, what is it that is beautiful about a place that people will want to enjoy and um, you know, feel is uh, warm, friendly, family oriented. You know, that, I think there's a lot of that. We're having staycations in Ireland. This is the word of the moment, which I'm sure it is in the States as well. And, People are refinding parts of Ireland and loving it and, and reporting on it and you know, on social media. So I think we're feeling good about our island from that point of view. And uh, we hope that uh, Americans in particular will want to come in the future when it's safe and we can, we can welcome them. Great. Well, thank you so much. And we'd love if uh, when travel permits, if you're uh, next time you're back in the U.S., if we could induce you to Southern Illinois, uh, not too far from St. Louis, not that far from Chicago, uh, because we'd love to show you this part of the world. And I know you have lots of invitations, but we, will, we would love to have you here. So thank you so much for your time. Not at all, it's been a pleasure, thank you. Thank you so much. And thanks all of you for joining another installment of our Understanding Our New World. Uh, this interview will be on YouTube tomorrow on our YouTube channel. Uh, please keep following us on social media. And please uh, thank you again for supporting the, the Institute where we keep the legacy of Paul Simon alive and well. Thank you so much.